It was established to prevent war and promote peace. But as the UN marks a historic milestone, we ask, is it still relevant today or is it no longer fit for purpose? I'm Ali Aslan, and today on The Newsmakers, we look at the United Nations on its 75th anniversary. In the wake of World War II, global powers came together to create the United Nations. Its aim was to maintain security, resolve conflict, and foster social progress, essentially to make the world a better and safer place. There have been successes and, of course, failures over the past 75 years, but today the UN faces arguably its greatest challenges since its formation. Is it capable of overcoming multiple crises in a deeply divided world, or has it become too inefficient and ineffective? That debate in just a moment. But first, Adam Platt's reports. As it celebrates its 75th anniversary, the UN is beset by challenges. The coronavirus, climate change, faltering faith in multilateralism, and increasing competition between world powers, to name just a few. We must do everything to avoid a new Cold War. We are moving in a very dangerous direction. Our world cannot afford a future where the two largest economies split the globe in a great fracture, each with its own trade and financial rules and internet and artificial intelligence capacities. But critics say historically, the UN has been ineffective at tackling global problems. It's had many successes for sure, among them, the eradication of smallpox and the delivery of life-saving aid to millions of people affected by countless conflicts and natural disasters. But it's also had failures. Peacekeeping missions in Rwanda, Bosnia and Somalia did little to prevent genocide or the creation of a failed state. And the wars in Iraq and Kosovo were fought with no Security Council approval. Among its most critical member states is the US. President Trump was scheduled to address the General Assembly in person, but in a perceived slight, the acting deputy ambassador took his place. The United Nations has for too long been resistant to meaningful reform, too often lacking in transparency and too vulnerable to the agenda of autocratic regimes and dictatorships. Washington has been by far the UN's biggest funder since its foundation, but the Trump administration has pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement, abandoned the Iran deal, and left the Human Rights Council and the World Health Organization. A reoccurring theme in world leaders' pre-recorded messages to the 75th General Assembly was that of reform. We cannot fight today's challenges with outdated structures, without comprehensive reforms, the UN faces a crisis of confidence. And it's the Security Council which comes under most scrutiny. It's composed of 15 states, 10 of which revolve, while five are permanent members and have a veto. But four countries in particular, Brazil, Germany, Japan, and India, are lobbying for permanent seats. Membership of the UN has increased nearly 400% since its foundation, and the relative power of nations has significantly shifted. But the Security Council structure has only changed once, when in 1965, non-permanent seats were increased from six to 10. Without reform, critics say the UN is in danger of losing legitimacy. But will the five veto powers allow this? And even if reformed, will the UN be able to improve its sometimes checkered track record? Adam Pletz, The Newsmakers. To discuss this, I am joined now by Richard Falk. He's the former UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in the Occupied Palestinian Territories. Alina Lein is a political science professor at the University of New Hampshire and co-author of the book, The United Nations, 75 Years of Promoting Peace, Human Rights and Development. And George Samueli is a senior research fellow at the Global Policy Institute. Welcome to you all. Richard, the UN was born from the wreckage of World War II, in essence, to make this world a better and more peaceful world. 75 years seems like a good time to look back and rate the performance of this most prominent international 
organization. How would you, how would you assess the performance of the UN 75 years on? Well, I think the first thing to take account of is that the UN was designed to be limited by the political will of the five great powers that were victorious in World War II. And so the failures of the UN are, in a sense, the reflected failures or the priorities of geopolitics. And at the present time, we have this great historic paradox when the UN is needed more than ever before in international history and yet is probably at its weakest point. That doesn't mean it's irrelevant, but it does mean that it can't perform in the way in which the world needs global problem solving and global cooperation. And, and that it's important to understand that that was part of the plan. The plan was to make the UN fail whenever a leader like Trump withdrew uh, support and authority, and he was the leader of the dominant political actor in the world. That was part of the plan. Yeah, Alina, of course, as Richard said, the United Nations reflected the realities of the world and global powers of 1945. Now it's 2020. And before we get into the nuts and bolts of what reforms the institution may need, let me get your assessment as well of how you rate the UN 75 years, the first 75 years. Well, thank you for the opportunity to comment on this. First, um, I agree largely with Richard that it was, you know, it was created in 1945 for the prevention of peace and for the promotion of peace and security, really in the shadow, this very long shadow of two wars. Now, the UN is also, you know, when we do assessments like this, remember the UN is an organization of organizations. So when we talk about the Security Council, as Richard points out, it's an arena for pow great powers to come together. And if they want to, if there is consensus, they can move things forward. And we have seen moments in which that has happened. 1991, for example, with the Persian Gulf War, um, there has been moments in which the UN has been very effective. But when we do broader assessment, we also need to look at things like the programs and the funds, UNICEF, United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the World Food Program, the World Health Organization. And so rather than kind of just a blanket, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down, it's done a good job or it's done a poor job. I invite us to think about many different institutions within the UN that some of them have been very effective and very successful, and others, of course, have had moments of great failure. Many divisions and layers, of course, within the UN, quite a complex structure if you look closer. And Alina, of course, you're right, the WHO, UNICEF, the UN Refugee Agency, they've all done very important and relevant work throughout the years. But they have, of course, also been failures, which left the UN vulnerable to outside criticism, George. Uh, uh, how do you rate the UN? What's your assessment 70, at, at its 75th uh, birthday and anniversary? Well, I think it's um, had uh, several outstanding achievements, which is <clears throat> the United Nations Charter, which enshrined the principle of the sovereign equality of all states, outlawed aggression and interference in the uh, internal affairs of uh, sovereign states, no matter how small. And it uh, ensured that as a Security Council that respected the rights and prerogatives of the great powers. If it didn't do that, then the United Nations would have gone the same way of the League of Nations, namely the great powers would have walked out, which is that's what happened with the, with the League of Nations. The great powers walk out because it doesn't respect their uh, prerogatives. And I think it's been an achievement of the uh, United Nations that in fact, none of the powers has walked out. Uh, you know, however tense things were during the Cold War, nonetheless, the United States, the Soviet Union, uh, continued to participate in the work of the United Nations. And even now, uh, the United States, you know, under Trump or whatever, uh, con continues to participate uh, in the work of the uh, UN. And that is an achievement. Richard, the criticism that is often directed towards the UN is fairly known. It's too bureaucratic, too slow too inefficient, too ineffective, at times undemocratic, all those true? Yes, I think those are uh, legitimate criticisms, but they're not the fundamental weaknesses. The fundamental weaknesses 
are the lack of independence. The UN has no independent funding. It, uh, the Secretary General is subject to the approval of the five permanent members, making it a somewhat of a race to the bottom. And the whole atmosphere of the UN is controlled by uh, states rather than controlling states. And that's the fundamental weakness. These other bureaucratic uh, limitations are things that it's easy to criticize, but they are, in my view, basically reformable details rather than the fundamental explanation of the weakness of the UN. Alina, uh, so the UN is made up of 193 nations, so in essence it's as strong and as weak as its member states want it to be. Isn't that the case? Absolutely. So when you have, you know, for example, in the early 1990s, when there was a lot of consensus and there wasn't a lot of conflict between particularly the great powers, um, you can see a lot of momentum. You have a lot of uh, potential for work to be done, whether or not it's sending agendas like uh, the Millennium Development Goals or the Sustainable Development Goals or peacekeeping operations. You really need countries to, one, come to some agreement and then also be able to, just as Richard points out, to be able to pony up and to be willing to pay for those commitments, right? So you do the last thing that you want in the United Nations are unfunded mandates. And what we're seeing, one of the trends that we're seeing is a move towards what we call voluntary contributions rather than assessed contributions in which countries will pay their fair share, if you will, but they want it to be earmarked for certain programs for their own pet projects, which exactly as Richard points out, means that the UN then is tugged and pulled by country interest rather than what might be uh, you know, succinct or cohesive policy that they're trying to put together. George, in its uh, founding pamphlet, the UN set out very high, ambitious, if not even idealistic uh, goals. Uh, was it even set to, I don't know, fail perhaps the wrong word, but uh, were, were the ambitions, the expectations just too high and unrealistic to begin with? Well, I think so, because you can't outlaw uh, conflict and the fact is that great powers will do whatever they need to do, and there's nothing that you can do to stop them. So um, one can uh, object to what the United States does, uh, but ultimately no one's going to stop the United States because it's the greatest power in the world, and therefore it will get its own way. So the United Nations has to work around it and try to get as much cooperation as possible from the great powers while recognizing that uh, in, in practice uh, there's not much that you can do uh, to stop the great powers. But nonetheless, the goals are, are, are there, and, and it provides a measure um, uh, to, uh, you know, against the, the great powers. I mean, the fact is that when the United States uh, launches an, an aggressive war, as it did against uh, Iraq in 2003, it still felt that it had to go to the United Nations and get authorization. It failed to get authorization. And, and in its failure, we had a measure. We had, yeah, we can say it's an illegal war. It's an illegal war because the Security Council refused to go along with it. And, that's a, and that is something. That's a, that's a major uh, achievement of the United Nations, that it provides a measure. It can't stop the United States, but it provides a measure by which you can determine is this illegal or is, not, is it not illegal? So, so you think the criticism then, George, directed towards the UN in its failings in Srebrenica, in failing to prevent atrocities in Srebrenica and Rwanda, and most recently uh, in, in uh, Myanmar or the uh, Uyghurs uh, in China, it, that, that's unfair? Yes, because um, I I intervention in general is something that you have to be very, very wary of. And uh, one can give an example of when you had a consensus in the Security Council in the 1990s, which was the sanctions against Iraq, that was devastating. And so you can say, oh, well, it's great, we have a consensus within the Security Council, but what was the effect of that? The effect of that was actually a horrific uh, sanctions regime 
that uh, created untold misery for uh, the people of Iraq. So one should be a little uh, careful uh, signing off on every kind of intervention or sanctions regime just because all the members of the Security Council are uh, supporting it. Richard, of course, uh, one of the UN's favorite uh, terminology is multi lateralism and COVID-19 of course displayed once more the fragility of the world. This could have been a shining moment for the UN, no? Yes, absolutely. It was a golden opportunity that was completely uh, missed and the Secretary General did his best, I think, to try to mobilize the political will needed to take advantage of this uh, challenge. But unfortunately, the ultranationalism of several of the most important states in the world at this point uh, limits the possibilities of creative global problem solving. And so this uh, COVID crisis illuminates the weaknesses of the UN much more than the strengths, but it does call attention to the potentialities and it calls attention I think it should call attention of, of the media and public opinion to the need for reforming the UN so that it can perform uh, not only for national interest, but for the global public interest, the human interest and uh, global interest generally. Uh, Alina, uh, many of these global challenges, whether it's COVID-19 or climate change, they all require a multilateral response and coordination. But the reality that we see on the ground is that more and more nation inch towards more nationalism. Isn't that the case? It is. I mean, this is a, an incredible paradox. So you see the at the same time, there is enormous demand and probably no more more time in my lifetime with COVID-19, transnational terrorism, chemical weapons, you know, refugee crisis with over 70 million displaced persons, you know, the same uh, only since the end of World War II, the list is very long in terms of the need for countries to cooperate. So many of those countries can, so many of these issues cannot be addressed without multilateralism, meaning several countries coming together. And you're absolutely right. At the same time, this particular moment happens, we have uh, the countries pulling, powerful countries pulling apart. It doesn't change the, it doesn't change the need for multilateralism. And the plumbing is there, the infrastructure is there, the architecture is there. If countries want to come together and try to work collectively to solve those issues. So at the end of the day, it's a matter of political will. And if the political will, Alina, is not there, then even the UN in its best uh, form and intentions cannot do a single thing. Exactly. I mean, we think about the UN as two UNs. One is an arena for countries, and the other is the bureaucracy itself. And the bureaucracy has no authorization, no capacity to move without the member states, the countries that are the members, pushing forward and saying, this is the direction we want to go. So what's the solution then, George? Uh, how do we make the UN more relevant uh, on the eve of its 75th anniversary at a time when nationalism and protectionism seems to be uh, back on the agenda? Well, I think the way to do it is um, to get a consensus uh, among the powers, and particularly the great powers, as to what the uh, major issues uh, of today are and what they need uh, and how they need to be addressed. Unfortunately, that really isn't the case. Um, I, was, I was just going to say, George, quite on the contrary, the major powers are at full confrontation. U.S. and China but, yeah. are in a somewhat open open a uh, new Cold War, if you will. That, that, that's right. But you also have to look at the fact that the United States, the United Kingdom, France, uh, three of the permanent uh, members of the United Nations Security Council, there also happen to be uh, three member states of NATO. And as NATO member states, they pursue their own particular agenda. And their agenda, unfortunately, is confrontation with Russia. Well, as long as they pursue a policy of confrontation with Russia, then it's, there's unlikely to be any serious uh, coming together of the great powers uh, to work out uh, a common approach to these global problems. And I think that's why we, you know, for the last few years and maybe last decade, um, you know, the UN Security Council has been a kind of a waste of time with these endless uh, rehashing of Cold War uh, 
uh, ideas and propaganda which have no relevance to uh, the global problems that today, which, which I think uh, Alina articulated very well. Those are the issues that the UN should be addressing. Instead, uh, too often the UN Security Council is just refighting the Cold War. And the Security Council, indeed, Richard, oftentimes pointed towards as one of the institutions within the UN that needs uh, reform the most uh, needed and uh, desperate. If you look at the makeup, with all due respect, countries like the UK and uh, France, they probably wouldn't make the cut now in 2020, would they? No, they're not part of the most salient actors on the international scene. And the uh, geopolitical landscape has changed since 1945, which is not surprising. Decolonization has occurred. There have been major transformations in international uh, society. And so it is imp important also to recognize that the UN was established at a time when international law was taken seriously by the main geopolitical actors, and particularly the United States. And the self-restraint of the big powers by reference to international law really was the political precondition for an effective UN in the war peace domain. I agree with, completely with Alina that, that there is the so-called other UN that does lots of useful things that don't make the headlines but help people and create cooperative solutions to a wide variety of problems. And there are, there's a big agenda of issues that rational statesmen of the leading countries would turn to the UN and to global problem solving and multilateralism for the solution. But the political will, as you suggested, Ali, is just not present at this time. Alina, um, so how do we make the UN then more relevant in the 21st century? It's an institution you, you clearly care about, you wrote about it, um, you do praise it for the many good things that it has done in the over seven decades, um, but how do we make it then relevant for a new century? Well, I think it's an excellent question. The UN is a little like an old computer <laughs> that doesn't quite work so well. And so you're adding extra hard drives and extra peripherals. And, and so it's become this kind of very sprawling, cobbled together organization. It's the organization we have. It's the only one that has any type of capacity to operate at the global level with universal membership. I mean, I think if there was, you know, top three things that I would suggest. One is more autonomy to do the work that the member states asked it to do. The second piece of that is funding. The stability of funding is something that plagues the UN in so many agencies and so many funds, I mean, the, consistently. The other thing, the third thing I would say is that the UN itself needs to be a better ambassador for itself. It does lots and lots of amazing work throughout the world, and it's not a very good advocate in which it tells the world, particularly within the United States, all of the things that have done. For example, if you take smallpox eradication, the World Health Organization, for all its abuse with in the last seven months has been very effective. It has its problems, it is not perfect, but going forward with a COVID vaccine, it will be a key player in the global distribution of that. And it knows how to do this and it has experience doing that. So again, I, I would just argue that the UN needs to advocate for the United Nations kind of at going to public forums. I think there's no uh, discontent here on this panel that the UN does need reform to be more relevant and agile in a rapidly changing and challenging world. Uh, George, uh, what are you two, two, three recommendations as to how to make the institution more relevant? I think um, there really has to be a change uh, in the attitude among the uh, United Nations Security Council members, uh, particularly uh, the great powers. Once they can uh, begin to address the real issues of today and, and the areas in which uh, true cooperation is possible, then we can actually move forward on, uh, on, on the common uh, global agenda. Uh, as things stand, uh, it, it really is just simply uh, the en endless kind of disputes that go on at the Security Council, which are often have no real uh, bearing on, uh, on, on, the, on the major issues. Um, and until that happens, you know, I'm afraid that um, 
you know, <laughs> there isn't going to be any, any real progress. And things certainly, uh, yeah. and things certainly have uh, become easier now that uh, heads of states are not able to meet in New York for face-to-face -face meetings to uh, commemorate this joyous occasion. Richard, uh, what do you wish uh, uh, the UN on its 75th birthday? Well, I wish that it has more responsible representation by the important governments of the world, not only the five members of the uh, UN Security Council, but other states in other parts of the world. I think if that, that were to happen, you would have a different atmosphere within the UN that could lead to all these sensible reforms and build the political will to solve the global agenda that we all agree uh, needs to be dealt with globally yes. and cooperatively. It will help all states. And if, as long as we have this idea that geopolitics uh, takes precedence over international law and over the rationality of cooperation, we're going to have uh, double standards, one set of rules for the weak, right and another set of rules for the strong. And, and, and unfortunately, absolutely. Unfortunately, I have to cut you off there, Richard. We're out of time, but thank you so much for Richard, for Alina Line and George Samueli for your insights, uh, not just looking back, but looking forward, how to make the UN a better and more agile, efficient institution. Thanks to you out there for watching as well, and hope to see you again next time for a new edition of Newsmakers.